That was probably the greatest spring, you know, that I can ever remember in sports history in New York. Almost every night was a magic night at the Garden. The Rangers kept winning. The Knicks kept winning. And you started to sense maybe this was going to be a special year in the history of New York franchises. They played 48 playoff games between them. I think it was 25 of those 48 were at Madison Square Garden. That was a huge deal. Doug and I, we were so worn out by the time it ended. I mean, we just both went on vacation. I just remember Knicks, Rangers, Knicks, Rangers. Where do we go? What do we do? Here we go. We're going here, then we're going there, then we're going here, then we're going there. And it was just nonstop. Anthony has to fire and hits the three. I think I maybe had two days off all spring. Welcome to Madison Square Garden, the world's most famous arena. I spent more time at the Garden than I spent anywhere else. That was my life. I covered every single game. I flew from you name it. I've probably set a record on Continental Airlines because every time there was a Nick game that I had to go to, there was a Ranger game in between. And I just thought it was just magical. The Rangers win! They're going to the finals! You have both teams in the championship at the same time. It was just such a cool time. We were definitely rooting for them just like they were rooting for us. And we was hoping that both of us would win it so we'd have a duel parade. We were coming in for shoot around and Mike Keenan driving down the right by our locker room, the hallway on a motorcycle at like 35 miles an hour. We just felt there was something about more than the teams themselves, but the building. It was the garden's turn to have both of these trophies the same summer. It was the spring of 1994, 54 long years since the Rangers had last won the Stanley Cup, and 21 years since the Knicks were last crowned NBA champions. The Madison Square Garden faithful were star for a title run. But sports fans weren't the only ones suffering in New York. In fact, the whole city seemed desperately in need of some good news. Going into 1994, we were coming off a really difficult time in New York City because we had just experienced the Crown Heights riots. We had just had the first bombing of the World Trade Center. Unemployment was high. The city was perceived as not a safe place. There was a tremendous sense of pessimism in New York. There was a sense that the city's best days were long behind it and half the city wanted to leave. That summer, 93, the Parks Commissioner was dedicating a new area in Central Park, and she was standing there by the lake at, at a press conference. Cameras were rolling, and as she pointed to the improvements, a dead body bobbed to the surface of the lake. It was kind of a bleak period for New York. It was a depressing place. It was a dangerous place. For many people, it was time to think about getting out. I moved to the suburbs because I'd walk outside my apartment and I could hear the crunch of crack vials under my shoe as I was walking down the street. With social and economic problems mounting, New York City found itself in dire straits in the early 90s. And the teams that called the garden home only reflected the prevalent malaise. And as time expires, the Rangers are finished for 1992-93 on home ice. The Rangers endured a miserable 1992-93 season, finishing in last place in the NHL's Patrick Division. Bitter disappointment. Rangers finishing in dismal fashion. Meanwhile, the Knicks raised everyone's hopes with a 60-win season, tops in the Eastern Conference. What time is it? But for the third straight year, those hopes were dashed by a certain number 23 from Chicago. What I remember about the 93 team was that pound for pound, that was probably the best team that the Knicks had during that decade. They had the best record, they had home court advantage. And of course they won the first two games. The Knicks have made a two out of two against the Chicago Bulls. Two nothing lead on the Bulls. There's 
the sense the Knicks are serious, they have a shot, they have the Bulls number, and then they just collapse. The Bulls have defeated the Knicks! I remember the torture of it. It just didn't seem fair. You had this feeling that when the Knicks were going to get to the point where they could possibly climb over the hump, they were going to fall short. Dejection for the New York Rangers. And the Rangers in 93, they didn't even make the playoffs, so I didn't know what to think about that team. It'll be another wakeful next year for the New York Rangers. People forget, opening night, 93-94, the great Messier, he's hearing some boos because they didn't make the playoffs in 92-93. I, Rudolph William Giuliani, I, Rudolph William Giuliani, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear, and that I will faithfully discharge the duties, that I will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of mayor of the city of New York. The office of mayor of the city of New York. So help me God. So help me God. 1994 was kind of a pivotal year for New York City. We suddenly had a new mayor coming in, Rudy Giuliani, and he came in at a time when the city really was looking for a change. When Giuliani took over, he felt that he was facing a city that was not as glossy as it used to be. So many New Yorkers were fearful of crime, fearful about their quality of life. Here comes this crime buster. I'll place a much greater emphasis on stricter enforcement of the law. He was a former prosecutor, and his goal was to get rid of crime and to make the city a safer and a better place to live. New York City was now in the hands of a new leader. The Rangers made their own change and brought in head coach Mike Keenan, known throughout the league as brash, exacting, and almost maniacally focused. I had broadcast the Stanley Cup final in 1993 with Mike Keenan, and the Stanley Cup was on display in the lobby of the hotel. And I was just thinking back to all those years as a fan and mumbled to Keenan, well, one of these years. And Mike turned to me and he said, bleeping right, one of these years. He had that sense of determination as a coach that gave them a great chance to win. In 1994, they played their very first game. It was an exhibition game in London. And when they walked in the room, there was a picture of the Stanley Cup on the wall. And it was put there by Mike Keenan. And from that day, they knew what the mission was. Keenan's the locomotive in the front. Messier's the diesel in the back. Messier, Messier scores! What a shot! Mark came into the organization, kind of watched what was going on, and then slowly said, you know, this isn't the way the locker room should be. You know, everybody can't see each other we need everyone to be able to see each other and move things out of the middle of the locker room Messier takes it all the way and scores! but while messier's presence had changed the culture in the rangers locker room the results were slow to translate onto the guards fabled ice mark messier was brought in to presumably bring a championship to new york was too much heaped on his shoulders oh, that's new york it's over the penguins win he didn't deliver the cup when he came, and he didn't deliver the cup the next year. In fact, things went sour. For the 52nd consecutive year, it'll be another wait till next year for the New York Rangers. People forget, opening night, 93-94, he's hearing some boos because they didn't make the playoffs in 92-93. They weren't happy with the guy. He hadn't become God yet. <laughs> Meanwhile... Basketball's reigning deity took an unexpected vacation. In October of 1993, Michael Jordan traded in his famous high tops for a pair of baseball cleats. I remember being at the first Bulls game when they gave out their rings from the previous year. Out came Bill Cartwright and then Pippen, and they used to build up to the introduction of Jordan. And all of a sudden, they announced Pete Myers. Pete Myers! And it just seemed as if right then and there, the Bulls were dead. When you're Patrick Ewing, and you are the best player in the Knicks, and you're the man who's been given the assignment to win a championship, and then Jordan's not there to counter, 
and go against, the pressure is tremendous. Both Ewing and Messier carried the burden of immense expectations into their 1993-94 seasons. And both responded like great leaders on a championship mission. The Rangers soared to the top of the NHL's Eastern Conference standings, while their Garden brethren did the same in the NBA, posting a 57-25 regular season record. Good enough for first place in the Atlantic Division. Game tied at 94. Not only did the Knicks have a good team, but they had the kind of team you could love. That Knick team really embodied New York. Charles Oakley, John Starks, the passion that those guys played with. They weren't perfect players. They weren't great players. They were great team guys. Oakley from Ewing, yes, and it counts. Nice pass from Ewing. People can write it in the book. The Knicks are going to come in. They're going to play hard. They're going to smack you around. We're going to play defense. We're going to... Do whatever we have to do, scratch, claw, to get the win. The Knicks were so tough. They were so tough. They should have been a hockey team. Look at Pat Riley. Pat Riley is trying to break it up. The Rangers, you know, they were the epitome of Messi. The Rangers, with 1.5 seconds on the clock, have won it in overtime. You know, you never give up as Messi wins it. They're winning almost every night. The Rangers have now won seven in a row. And you had a feeling that this could be something special. And so you could feel a sense of people wanting that weight to be lifted. Again, a chewing with the rejection. Wait on Richter and a save. Made the rebound, another save. Richter kicked it out. Each team had so many different guys like that who were just hardworking type blue-collar players that the fans can embrace when you have players like a Marc Messier. And he scores! John Starks, who plays with so much emotion and passion. Starks took it away! That's what made it special. The New York Rangers advance to the conference final. People started to see the possibility that these two teams could bring championships to the same building. At Newsweek, we look at years as whether they were good news years or bad news years. 1994 was a great year for news. You had the O.J. Simpson trial, which really dominated. You had goofy tabloid stories like Tanya Harding assaulting her figure skating rival Nancy Kerrigan. And you had the death of two icons in American life, Richard Nixon and Jacqueline Kennedy Onassis. At the Garden, the Rangers and Knicks entered the playoffs looking to make news of their own by capturing a double championship for the city of New York. In the pursuit of that goal, both teams easily dispensed with their first round foes. In the second round, the Rangers continued their dominance of the overmatched Washington Capitals, breezing through the series in five games. For the first time since 1986, the New York Rangers advance to the conference finals. But the Knicks' second round matchup was anything but breezy as they ran head on into their Windy City rivals. We wanted to kill them, they probably wanted to kill us. That was basketball that was fierce. We have a very ugly scene once again. But I miss the Knicks Bulls. I, 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 would, I wish there was a Knicks Bull game tonight. The Knicks and Bulls split the first four games of their second round series, trading home victories two and two. Two coach for the win! Back at the Garden for game five, the home team got some home cooking as a questionable foul on Hubert Davis. Sent the Knicks guard to the line with 2.1 seconds remaining, and the Bulls up 86-85. Here's the one to tie it. They got many more benefit of the doubt Jordan call, so we weren't going to apologize for getting one benefit of the doubt call. And Davis has given the Knicks a one-point lead. I've seen a lot of things in the NBA, but I have never seen what happened at the end of the game like that. It took a miracle for us to still win. 
Um, Hubert Davis came in and bailed us out. The Bulls evened up the series in Chicago, bringing Game 7 back to New York. There, as it had all season, the pressure once again fell on the ample shoulders of Patrick Ewing. Patrick Ewing has in the second half. After a slow start, Ewing turned in a career-defining performance, one capped off with the most unlikely shot in the fourth quarter. Patrick scores something like 18 points in the second half, including the shot that everyone remembers, and basically clinched it. Well, that was kind of luck, but he didn't call it, so you got to call those shots. But we'll take it. That was a big, big shot for us. They still had a couple of roads to get through, but you finally felt that they beat the Bulls. The Knicks have defeated the Bulls. The take series in seven. A three-pointer off glass. It's in. It's good. We knew this was a once-in-a-lifetime thing. We knew that we could spend 30 years at the Garden and never see this again. And people started to see the possibility that these two teams could bring championships to the same building. The Knicks are trying to advance to the finals for the first time since their championship season of 1973. What a turnaround it has been for the Rangers team that didn't even make the playoffs a season ago. As a kid, my mother always used to say, you should always be content when you want me to buy an ice cream cone to get one scoop. I always wanted two scoops. Well, here, we New York fans, we were double dipping. We had one scoop with the Rangers and the other scoop with Ewing and the Knicks. It's hard for New Yorkers today to imagine New Yorkers thinking of themselves as a city of losers, but you have to remember these are the days when asking for a cup of coffee could get you a fat lip. And then suddenly you have this, a great sports story that everybody could just latch on to, and it made everybody happy in the city. It made us feel good. With both teams advancing out of the second round of the playoffs, the joy and anticipation at the Garden was contagious, but it was also marred with sudden tragedy. On the day that the Rangers clinched their second round series victory, Seal Seidel, a lifelong fan of the Blue Shirts, was brutally murdered inside her apartment building while trying to help a neighbor. It's very, very sad and emotional for me to talk about Seal because this lady had been a Ranger fan for all her life. She was just a very sweet, lovable, always smiling lady who loved the Rangers. When you saw Seal, you wanted to smile because she made you feel good. The people who sat with her, and nobody used that seat. They just left the seat open and put a bouquet of flowers there for her. They felt that her spirit was there by not occupying her seat, you know, that she was going to help out. I went to the hoop and I just kind of got a little bit too strong off the glass. There's Starks. There was a championship feeling in the building at Madison Square Garden. The Knicks defeat the Bulls today at the Garden. At our local station, we had a sports crazy general manager. So we would, instead of news cut-ins, they'd blow them away, and I'd be live from the Garden doing a Ranger cut-in. The Rangers win! It was the center of the universe. And it was just something you had to find a way to be at. Two sports, two Eastern Conference finals, two New York teams that call the Garden their home. To say the world's most famous arena was buzzing is the understatement of the century. The Knicks squared off against the up-and-coming Indiana Pacers, led by a noted Garden villain, Reggie Miller. I think it's going to be a good matchup. Meanwhile, on the ice, a pesky double squad awaited the Stanley Cup star New York Rangers. The Devils were tough. They jumped on top. The Rangers came back. The Rangers win in double overtime! Had a 2-1 lead, then played a bad game in game four. Mike Keenan pulled Mike Richter. 
he benched Brian Leach for a while, and you kind of, what's going on here? And you're, you thought maybe you were seeing the unraveling of the Rangers, then they came back, they lost game five. Four-one victory by the New Jersey Devils. They lead the Eastern Conference Championship 3-2. I remember saying to John Davidson after the game, has he screwed this up? Has he lost the team? While the Rangers stared elimination in the face, the Knicks waged a war of their own against the upstart Pacers. With the series tied at two games apiece, the Knicks faced a pivotal game five on their home court. On to the fourth quarter here at Madison Square Garden. Everything seemed to be going their way until suddenly the villain turned into Superman. It looks like, you know, it's going to be no problem from here. Then Reggie Miller, all of a sudden, he's not missing. Reggie Miller is on fire. He has 22. And I just remember it being one long jumper after another, after another, after another. And he hits it! It's a three-pointer for Reggie Miller! I'm like shaking my head the whole time. It's like, man. And I could see it in his eye. And when he got hot, I was like, this is going to be trouble. And sure enough, it was trouble. In a bizarre twist that could only happen at Madison Square Garden, Spike Lee found the center of attention shifting from the court to his prized courtside seats. I had no animosity towards Reggie Miller. He had no animosity towards me. Something happened, and he grabbed his privates and did this with his neck, and my wife is right there. Reggie Miller giving the choke side to Spike Lee. I said something to him. I mean, I didn't say anything about his wife or his mother i just said something to him and it wasn't profanity either and reggie miller in an animated discussion with spike lee and you were wondering you know why is spike taunting this guy some players need to be extra motivated i guess john starks wasn't good enough so he had to focus on me just an astounding shooting exhibition being put on by reggie Spike Lee? Spike who? <laughs> that was theater. You know, that's something you go up on Broadway to see. And then the game is over, and you can't believe what just happened. Reggie Miller finishes with 39 points, 25 on the fourth quarter. Both New York teams now trailed their series three games to two, and fans who had been dreaming of a double championship now were faced with the specter of double elimination. We found ourselves in a tough position being down 3-2 in the series and needed to find a way to win a tough game in their building. I felt a great way to do that would be to say I really believed we could win game six. I guarantee we can win game six. If you say that in New York, the whole world knows. We just kind of laughed at, uh, on the cover and said, way to go, Mark. <laughs> Look what you've done now. Niedermeyer centering. Look out! And the Devils are killing. I just killing them. And to me, one of the great lost pieces of history is what the New York back pages were going to say two periods through that game because we had all written our stories. Mike Keenan just feels I think this thing is starting to drift away. That there comes a point in a game like this where a team sometimes senses it's over. And if that happens, it is over. Down to one. The Rangers need it. Divine intervention. Kovalev moving in. Kovalev to Messier. Messier set. They tied the game. Save one goal. Rebound. Score. Mark Messier gets his second goal. From the empty net. That puck's in the air. Just landed. I'm going. He's going to get a hat trick. He's going to get the game winner a hat trick. And he called the game. Do you believe it? Do you believe it? He said we will win game six. He has just picked up a hat trick. After we did win, I was watching New York one, and the guy goes, Messier, you do have brass ones. MSG didn't televise the game, and I was so afraid to go there to watch the Rangers lose that it's the only game I didn't see. I watched it from home. The New York Rangers have beaten the Devils 4-2. to two. It's one of the biggest regrets I have, but I do know this. I saw one of the greatest performances in the history of modern sport that night. With Messier taking over the lead role in the New York headlines, the Knicks found themselves needing a star performance of their own 
They scratched out a Game 6 victory to even their series with the Pacers. The Knicks able to hang on, and they have tied the series at three. And then entered the seventh and deciding game at the Garden. For the Knicks and the Pacers, it has come down to this. With the legacy of their captain on the line. There was no way he was going to let his team lose. They were against a great opponent, and, and a loss to the Pacers on your home floor would have been absolutely devastating. But he would not let them. There's no way. Yes. Despite Ewing's mammoth performance, 22 points and 21 rebounds, Ewing with a drop step. Yes. the Knicks trailed the Pacers by a point with less than 30 seconds remaining in the game. Dale Davis put it down. I remember watching it, wondering who was going to take the last second shot. With the pick, here's Starks. I went to the hoop and I just kind of got a little bit too strong off the glass. Starks with the three. Ewing puts the ball. And the next ball. 46 seconds to go. And it was a great feeling. I remember slapping fire with a couple of fans. Pat getting mad. The game is not over. The game is not over. Keep playing. But it was a great feeling to finally, after all those years, especially where we started, winning 23 and, and winning 24 games, to finally, you know, get into the, to the finals. He wanted to share it with the fans. My hand raised, you know, finally, we're here. I remember it was Patrick rising up and thinking that that's what he was supposed to do. That's what he was supposed to be for this team. The moment they drafted him, he was supposed to rise up above every other player on the court and tip the ball in for a win. I was like, thank you. <laughs> I was like, thank you for being there. Yes. The next seven game heroics came from their captain, their superstar, delivering a game-saving putback that will live in Nick's lore forever. In the Rangers game seven against the Devils, heroics of no less dramatic variety were needed. There is a hero down there. We just don't know who it is. You put it in and you win and you move on to the Stanley Cup Finals. In the deciding seventh game of their series with the Devils, the Rangers found themselves holding a one-goal lead with just seconds left to play. A single face-off separated them from the Stanley Cup Finals. Pokemon trying to play it. Stepping up driver, Lammer is on. Center, not playing. Shots on the I was on the ice for that tying goal and kind of bounced through all of us right to the back corner and went in and I remember looking at Mike and he's jumping around. He couldn't believe it either. Madison Square Garden fans are stunned. We are going to overtime. I'm sitting in a chair with my head just bent, shaking my head. JD is pacing back and forth. He looks at me, he goes, what's the matter with you? And I said, what else can happen to this team? Man. Double overtime for the third time in this series. There is a hero down there. We just don't know who it is. You put it in and you win and you move on to the Stanley Cup Finals. Stays in the Devil's zone. Matteau goes for the puck. Stefan recovered the puck, I think, to the right of Brodeur and came in behind the net and tried to wrap around and somehow got in between Marty's... Uh, feet and pad and went in. Beto behind the net, swings it in front, he scores! Beto! 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 There was a woman behind me who was in high heels and she was jumping up and down like crazy, screaming at the top of her lungs. 
And she goes, this is the first hockey game I've ever been to. And I said, good, don't ever go to another one. It'll never be like this. When you have two teams in one building, it's not always an amiable relationship, but in the garden, it certainly was because the uh, Knicks and the Rangers were like friendly cousins who really liked each other and they fed off each other. You know, Mason would come to the garden and he'd have a, a Rangers jersey on. And I remember thinking Anthony Mason at a Rangers game, that was really cool. That was really cool. For the first time since 1979, the New York Rangers will play for the Stanley Cup. Uh, we were rooting for the Rangers. And at the time, I wasn't a big hockey fan. But you know, to watch Messier and Richter, all those guys playing, you became a fan. For only the second time in history, and the first time since 1972, both the Knicks and the Rangers had reached the finals of their respective sports in the same season. It was a startling achievement, but by no means a guarantee of success. Each team was beset by its own particular demons. The 54 years of futility for the Rangers didn't really hover over the Rangers so much as it smothered the Rangers. The chant of 1940 has not disappeared yet. That Nick team had its own legacy to deal with, namely the team that had won the two championships was absolutely revered in New York sports history. Hats off to the New York Knickerbockers. We have a new NBA champion. Talk about a hard act to follow. The Knicks lived every single day under the shadow of that championship team from 70 and 73. They were really tired about hearing it, about that. To them, that was their curse. It was probably about a half hour, 35 minutes in real time. It felt like about 54 years. Hit the post, and it cleared by Lowe! It's heading for the empty net! The Ravens will win! After jumping out to a 3-1 series lead over Vancouver, score, Ryan Leach. the Blue Shirts add the city in celebration mode, heading home to the Garden for Game 5. This is it. The People came to celebrate and believe this is it. We're excited. We've won three games in a row. We're going to win this next game, and it's going to be over. Well, the Vancouver Canucks, they've won. won. And that's it. This one is over. And the remaining fans with a Let's Go Rangers chant to send their team to Vancouver. There was no celebration. The Rangers lost game five and then game six in Vancouver. And that's it. The Vancouver Canucks have defeated the Rangers. This series is going to win. 1940! Glenn Healy said that half of New York had already dialed the nine and the one and we're getting ready to dial the other one. You start to think, wow, you know, did this happen again? Did they beat the Devils, go through this unbelievable year? All of this to lose again? They really will never win. I mean, you, you might as well fold up the franchise. The Rangers will have to regroup. And if they are to break the 54-year jinx, they will do it on home ice. This is the 10th time in NHL history that a Stanley Cup final has gone to seven games. Messier cuts in, still with a puck. Nice pass to Zubov. Zubov beats Leach. Leach scores! Final seconds of the second period. Standing ovation. The Rangers are 20 minutes away. The third period began with the Rangers holding a 3-1 lead. But for Rangers fans, conditioned to expect disappointment, that lead felt anything but safe. He shot it, they score! As it was batted in by Trevor Linden! After they scored that second goal, it was a long third period. You could see in the back of everyone's mind is, you know, I just gotta get through this shift. That would be one shift close to the Stanley Cup. 
after Vancouver made it three to two. It was probably about um, a half hour, 35 minutes in real time. It felt like about 54 years. You're one goal away from your dream, and somewhere in your mind you remember that, well, we had the lead on the Devils in game seven until there were seven seconds to go. Are we going to blow this one? With five minutes left to go, I had to go down to the ice because I was going to present the Stanley Cup, and I was keenly aware of the fact that was going to be either the biggest celebration or the biggest funeral in sports history. We won the Cup! We won the Cup! As the game reached its final minute, it seemed that the reality of the situation finally began to dawn on the Garden faithful. The Rangers were 60 seconds away from redemption. 37.8 seconds remaining. The Rangers trying to hold on to win the Stanley Cup for the first time in 54 years. The waiting is over. The New York Rangers are the Stanley Cup champions. And this one will last a lifetime. over and that's what I said the waiting is over and uh, it was just astounding and then it just everything came out the building rocked and the fans celebrated Let the, celebration begin. the waiting was indeed over when NHL Commissioner Gary Bettman arrived on the ice with the most celebrated trophy in sports Captain Mark Messi, come get the stand. Getting my hands on the Stanley Cup here in New York and doing it after 54 years and sharing it with the guys who were just as committed and had the same dreams was just an amazing feeling. Maybe an hour or two after the game, I came out and the arena's dead empty and there's only one guy in the arena and it was Mark Messier and he was standing at mid-ice and he was looking up and I looked up with him and I realized what he was looking at. He was looking at the 1940 banner. I remember looking at him and saying, Mark, you're figuring out where yours goes, aren't you? And he just started laughing. He said, he said yeah, it's a long time coming. Just to have him stand there and look up at that banner, uh, you know, that kind of set it off. The celebration that night lasted into the wee hours of the morning as the Rangers took Lord Stanley out on the town. We got into a cab and I said, take us to the Stanley Cup. The cab driver says, um, okay. He drives it around Upper West Side for an hour, and finally, we realized this guy wasn't going to deliver us to the Cup. The next cab we got, hailed it, go, take us to the Stanley Cup. He goes, oh, yeah, I know where it is. <laughs> and he drove us right to it. We got over this place. They're stopping people at the barrier, and uh, I, you know, shamelessly used my celebrity to get past the barrier and got up to the door of the club. Anyway, it was a blast. It was a great night. As the Rangers and their fans celebrated, the pressure mounted on the Knicks to complete the double championship. And the Rockets come away with the victory. After Houston took a 2-1 series lead, the Knicks got a jolt of inspiration from the man that led the Blue Shirts to the Stanley Cup just the night before. All of a sudden, here comes Mess out of the tunnel. The Willis Reed Tunnel, right, with the cup, holds it up, and the place goes berserk. So when he brought it out at halftime, you kind of felt like there was a synergy there. Like, wow, are they going to do the double here? Are we going to have both championships here? The Knicks rode the charged atmosphere in the Garden to a 91-82 Game 4 victory. And the Knicks beat the Rockets. The series is tied at two. The Stanley Cup was back in New York at last, and now the Knicks were only two wins away from joining the Rangers in championship heaven. People were out in the corridor where they were watching a basketball game on one set and OJ on the other set. While the Knicks found themselves just two games away from capturing the NBA title, before game five got underway at the Garden, the Rangers were honored for their triumph with a parade of the kind that can only happen 
in the heart of the Big Apple. I just remember seeing a sea of people for blocks and blocks and blocks down the main road of the Canyon of Heroes and people hanging out of windows and confetti and a scene that you can't really imagine. And here we were right in the middle of it. At one point, during all the noise and all the celebration and all the, the pouring of love from the stands, Richter just turned to Mark Messier in the back of one of those trucks and said, I wish we could get a flat tire so we could stay here all day. Just as game five began at the Garden, basketball found itself completely overshadowed by the most shocking, most bizarre news story ever to unfold on live national television. My wife thought that there was something wrong with the cable because the same image was on every channel of this white Bronco on the highway. Suddenly, this whole thing unfolds of O.J. Simpson in this low-speed chase along the highways of L.A. And it was just great television drama. That night, nobody was watching sports. Half the seats during the game were empty. People were out in the corridor where they were watching a basketball game on one set and O.J. on the other. And then, you know, even the network was splitting the screen during a basketball game. Here's Anthony doing with a spectacular windmill stop. And meanwhile, on the court, Patrick Ewing is having one of the great nights he's ever had in a big game situation. There's excitement and interest on the one hand, and there's this Greek tragedy playing out on, on the other. It looked like the Knicks, given all that had happened, were going to take game six or seven and win the championship. It just seemed like it was in the cards that night. And this one is headed back to Houston with the Knicks up three games to two. In Houston, the Knicks lost game six. So it was game seven for everything. One went away from that majestic ride down the Canyon of Heroes. This only the third time the past 16 years the NBA Finals have gone to a game of seven. Starts for three. In a must-win situation, when no player can afford to have it off night, passionate Knicks guard John Starks endured the worst game of his career. sickening because I felt that yeah, eventually I'm gonna get it going. John Starks is now two for 17. For me not to have a good game, you know, very, very disappointing. Not only for us as players, but for the fans of New York. I really think the Knicks deserve to win that series, and I would love to have seen considering the love of basketball and the love of hockey. If the Rangers drew four million people to the streets, how many would have come out for the city's game? That would have been amazing. Ultimately, New York's dream of a double championship was not to be, but despite the bitter disappointment, it was an electric run. 48 playoff games, one championship, and a lifetime of memories. The spring days and nights of 1994 have become the most memorable months in New York sports lore. The Rangers and Knicks helped the city get over its blues, helped the city develop a more optimistic view of things. And the sense the drop in crime and their victories all come at the same time. It totally swept the city. The city was so excited about having the cup here in New York. You had Mark Messier, you had Richter, you had Graves. They were heroes in this city at that time, and we needed a hero. And you just felt happy. You just felt good about New York City. And we needed to feel good at that point. and passion that the people displayed here. That's what made it so winning so special. 
you dream about that ever since you were a little kid about playing in the finals and, and playing for something that's meaningful. Starts for three. I can remember when Brian Leach and I were both young, we'd be walking through the city, just like, could you imagine winning here? I mean, could you imagine what it would be like? I got a pretty vivid imagination, but it was better than anything I had anticipated. They love that the New York City, and Mike Richter is at the top. Every game, every second, the fans was there, and they were in it. I have our towels waving. It was one of the, the, the best experiences of, of my life. You have to appreciate the fact that here were two teams with compelling legacies who were vying for a championship at the same time. It's a great theatrical story in the heart of the theatrical world. If we did this for 40 years, we would not ever have, have another spring as crazy as that spring was in 94.